Well, hi there. Thanks for coming by again. You know, when we first started doing this, these vegetables were nothing more than seeds and pots. Now look at them. Hopefully have some good vegetables sometime this summer. This is our last lesson of the year. And we're gonna look at some quadratic functions, some material we didn't get a chance to look at earlier in the semester. We're gonna start with factoring quadratic expressions, which is hopefully a bit of review for you. And then we'll move into solving quadratic equations. So it's kind of a two-part lesson. If you want, you don't have to do it all at once. And in the comments, I put the bookmarks in so you can skip ahead to the second part whenever you're ready. All right, come on, let's take a look one more time. So at the beginning of the course, we did look at some expanding. When we talked about some of the algebra that was behind dealing with quadratic expressions, remember that quadratic expressions are any degree two expressions. Anything with an x squared in them is the highest exponent. So we're going to look at factoring. Now factoring is the opposite of what's called expanding. So every time we want to learn a new factoring technique, we might start by expanding and looking for a pattern. Let's start with some simple expansion using the distributive property to simplify these two problems right here. So we can multiply everything by 2x and we get 2x squared take away 12x. And the next one, we can multiply everything by 3x, and we get negative 6x squared, take away 15x. So what we've done here is we've done, like I said, what's called expanding, or we expanded. It's the same as simplifying. If you wanted to go backwards the other way, we actually refer to that as factoring. So to multiply something out is expanding, and to do the opposite, which is kind of like dividing, is what's called factoring. And in these two examples, I would call 2x and x minus 6 factors, and I would call negative 3x and 2x plus 5 factors. So if someone asked you to factor something, and the question was 2x squared minus 12x, and you factored it, your answer would be 2x times x minus 6. And if someone asked you to factor negative 6x squared minus 15x, then your answer would be negative 3x times 2x plus 5. So let's look at some simple examples like that. This is called common factoring, by the way. Okay, finding the greatest common factor and common factoring. So what I do is I look at 3x squared plus 9x and I identify what's the biggest amount of stuff I can divide out of 3x squared plus 9x. Well, 3 and 9 both divide by 3. 3 divides by 3 to give you 1, and 9 divides by 3 to give you 3. But x squared and x both divide by x. So actually, my greatest common factor is 3x. When I divide that out, I get x plus 3. I am assuming that this isn't the first time you've seen that, because you, you should have seen that last year as well. We can check our answer just mentally. 3x times x is 3x squared, and 3x times 3 is 9x. And there's nothing else that I could take out of this or divide out of this. For the next one, 4y squared minus 16y, I can factor out a 4y, and I'm left with y take away 4. 4y times y, 4y squared. 4y times negative 4, negative 16y. For the next one, notice that 5 and 3 don't have any common factors other than 1. Well, that's fine. But f squared and f, we can divide by f. We get 5f take away 3, and that's considered to be factored as well. f times 5s is 5f squared, f times negative 3, negative 3f. So there's the very first simplest factoring method, is just doing what's called common factoring. Another thing we did at the beginning of the course was we looked at expanding using FOIL. So when you multiply two, call them binomials, together using the distributive property, you multiply the first terms together, x times x, which is x squared, followed by the outside terms, x times 3, which is 3x, followed by the inside terms, 4 times x is 4x, followed by the last terms, 3 times 4 is 12. And another way of looking at it is just you're multiplying everything in the first set of brackets by everything in the second set of brackets. So multiply both of them by x and then multiply both of them by 4. You have some like terms in the middle. If you have 3x's, you add 4x's, you have 7x. 
So we're doing some expanding here in the hopes that we will find a pattern that will then help us do the opposite, which is factoring. In the next one, I get y squared plus 3y plus 2y plus 6, which gives me y squared plus 5y plus 6. Continuing that, for this one, you might notice that you're kind of able to do this in one step. y times y is y squared plus 3y plus 2y, you might realize that's a 5y all in one step. So here I'm going to get x times x, which is x squared, plus 2x, take away 3x is going to be minus x, take away 6. And for the last one, you should get x squared minus 10x plus 24. Okay, x times x gives me x squared minus 6x minus 4x, so those outside inside terms go together to give you negative 10x, and then negative 4 times negative 6 is positive 24. I'm kind of skipping that step, aren't I? This step that I did right here in the first two, okay, notice that I skipped it in the last two. And that's because I actually want you to notice the pattern. Do you see a pattern here? If I am thinking now about factoring, if I think about my goal being to do the opposite, start with something like x squared plus 7x plus 12 and change it into x plus 4 times x plus 3. Notice where the 12 comes from. It comes from 4 times 3. And notice where the 7 comes from. It comes from 3 plus 4. And that's true for all these. Look at the 5. 3 plus 2 is 5 and 3 times 2 is 6. Negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1 and negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. And finally, negative 4 plus negative 6 is negative 10, and negative 4 times negative 6 is positive 24. So we have a method for factoring what are called simple trinomials. These are called simple trinomials because they have three terms, like an x squared, an x term, and then a number, or a y squared, a y term, and then a number. And notice in all of them, the x squared term, the coefficient, the number in front of x squared is equal to 1. So we might say they have this form right here, x squared plus bx plus c. I call those simple trinomials. And you can always factor them by looking for two numbers that multiply to that number c and add to that number b. That pattern will help me factor any simple trinomial. And here's a few. x squared plus 9x plus 20. If I can find two numbers that multiply to 20 and add to 9, then I can factor those two numbers would be 5 and 4. So this factors to x plus 5 times x plus 4. Sorry, one second here. x plus 5 times x plus 4. If you multiplied that out, you get x squared plus 9x plus 20. And the next one, I'm going to look for two numbers that multiply to negative 15 and add to negative 3. Now, if you're having trouble thinking of those numbers, I'm going to give you a bit of a hint. There are only so many numbers that multiply to negative 15. There is a never-ending number of numbers that add to negative 3. So start with all the numbers that multiply to negative 15. There's only so many of them. 5 and 3, and 15 and 1. Now, if one of those numbers is, sorry, if the answer is negative 15, then one of those numbers has to be negative and the other has to be positive. And this is a very poor question, actually, because there are no such numbers that exist. Kind of my mistake, but there you go. So this one actually does not factor. Sorry about that, not a very good one to start with. I'm gonna keep going though anyways, rather than change that example. Let's try another one that does work out. Two numbers that multiply to negative 30 and add to negative one. Okay, so numbers that multiply to 30 would be numbers like 6 and 5, 30 and 1, 15 and 2, 10 and 3. There's only so many possibilities. Now, in order to make it negative 30, one of those numbers has to be negative. And in order to add to negative 1, the only way that works is negative 6 and 5. So this factors to x minus 6 times x plus 5. This is probably something you've seen. You should have seen this last year, but if you haven't, hopefully you're catching on. For the next one, find two numbers that multiply to positive 6 and add to negative 5. Now, in this case, our two numbers 
multiply to a positive number. So they're either both positive or they're both negative. If they add to a negative number, which is it? Well, they both have to be negative. And the numbers are negative 3 and negative 2. So we get s minus 3 times s minus 2. And for the last one, two numbers that multiply to positive 12 and add to negative 8 are negative 6 and negative 2. If you can't find those numbers, sorry, let me rephrase that. Look at question B again. Notice in B, it's not that we couldn't find those numbers. It's that they don't actually exist. There are no such numbers, no integers, no whole numbers that work. And this means that this one it does not factor. It's just like the number, say, 13. You can't factor the number 13. It's a prime number. It's the same thing for quadratic expressions. Sometimes they can't be factored. What about when the number in front of x squared isn't 1? Well, unfortunately, there's no way that this can factor to x times x, because that would be an x squared, and we have a 2x squared. So there's, there's no way that it's similar to the examples up here, okay? So how do you factor something like this? I sometimes call this a general trinomial, by the way. And depending what course you took last year in grade 10, you may or may not have learned how to factor those. We're not really going to focus on them in this lesson because I want to keep things simple. This actually does factor. It's 2x minus 3 times x plus 4. I mean, clearly those two numbers have to multiply to negative 12, but look at to see that this does produce the 5. 2x squared plus 8x minus 3x. There's your positive 5x. How, can I, how do I get this? Well, one way to get it is just trial and error. I know that the two numbers here have to, have to multiply to negative 12. I know these two numbers have to multiply to 2, and I'd better get 5 as my middle term. We're not going to worry about this lesson. I'm just pointing out that sometimes these trinomials can be factored. And if you know how to do it, that's great. And if you don't, we're not going to worry about that today. Brings us to the second part of our lesson, which is on solving quadratic equations. So to begin talking about solving quadratic equations, we could think about what an equation is, first of all. An equation is anything in math that has an equal sign. So it has a right side, a left side, and an equal sign, like 2x minus 5 equals 13. We call that a linear equation in this example because there's no exponent on the x. And we can solve it by isolating the variable. Now, solving the equation just means to find the value of x. So add 5 to both sides, and you get 2x equals 18. Divide by 2, and you get x equals 9. And sure enough, that makes sense. 2 times 9 is 18. Take away 5 gives you 13. So there's our solution. As we move on to quadratic equations, quadratic equations are going to have x squareds in them. Sometimes you can isolate the variable in a quadratic equation. In fact, both of these examples, that will work. Add 11 to both sides, and you get x squared equals 25. And then you can do one of two things. You can either realize that x equals 5, since 5 squared is 25, or you can say that x is equal to the square root of 25. Now, there is another solution, though. Not only does 5 squared give you 25, but negative 5 squared also gives you 25. So technically, there are two solutions. Now, the square root of 25 is positive 5, so in this case, we say plus or minus 25, and that's what that symbol means, plus or minus 25, and we could even just write plus or minus 5 as our answer. 2x squared minus 4 equals 16. Add 4 to both sides, so I'm trying to get x on its own. What's the next thing I do to get x on its own? Well, I divide both sides by 2, and I get x squared equals 10. Now, that's not a whole number. But x is either, again, the positive or negative of the square root of 10. You need a calculator to do that. And you get approximately plus or minus 3.16. So I call this isolating the variable in both of these examples. You basically, it's the same idea. You try to get x on its own. The only difference between doing it for a quadratic equation compared to a linear equation is you've got to somehow take the square root to get rid of the x squared. I mean, square rooting is the opposite of squaring something if as long as you include the plus minus.
Imagine you try to do the same thing with this equation here. I think you'll find that you can't easily isolate the variable. Why is that? Well, it actually has to do with the other x in the problem. The other, these examples just had the one x, the x squared. They didn't have an x term. If you tried to isolate the variable, you'd run into some problems. You might try doing this, x squared equals 5x take away 6, and then taking the square root. Well, that's not really a solution, is it? You can't say what x is by saying, hey, to find x, do 5x minus 6 and take the square root. That, that doesn't work. That's like telling someone directions to Owen Sound by first telling them to drive to Owen Sound. You're, you're using x to define x. So it just it's just kind of like going around in a circle. It doesn't work. What can you do? Well, x squared minus 5x plus 6, that's actually a simple trinomial. We can factor it. If I can find two numbers that multiply to positive 6 and add to negative 5, then I can factor it. Those two numbers are negative 3 and 2. So I can actually rewrite it as x minus 3 times x minus 2 equals 0. Not isolating the variable. A completely different strategy here. Factoring. How does that give me the answer? Well, take a look at what you've got. You've got two factors. This is multiplication. You're timesing these two things together and you get zero. Well, imagine you're multiplying two numbers together and your answer is equal to zero. What do you know about those numbers? Well, I think you'd realize that one of these two numbers has to be zero. That's the only way to get zero when you multiply two things together. So here I can say that either x minus 3 must be 0 or x minus 2 equals 0. If x minus 3 equals 0, then x equals 3. If x minus 2 equals 0, then x equals 2. And those are our two solutions, 2 and 3. I mean, imagine subbing x equals 3 here. What would you get? You would get 3 times 3, which is 0, and 3 times 2, which is 1. 0 times 1 is 0. Imagine subbing x equals 2 in. You would get 2 minus 3, which is negative 1, times 2 minus 2, which is 0. Negative 1 times 0 equals 0. And if you plug 2 into this equation up here, you'd find you get 0. Same thing if you plug 3 in. So there's your solution, your two solutions, x equals 3 or x equals 2. Here's another example, very similar. x squared plus 8x plus 15 equals 0. Find two numbers that multiply to 15 and add to 8. Those two numbers are 5 and 3. By the way, the order doesn't matter. If you put the 3 here or the 5 there, it doesn't matter. Okay, one of these two things must be 0 in order to multiply and get 0. Either x plus 5 equals 0 or x plus 3 equals 0. If x plus 5 equals 0, x equals negative 5. If x plus 3 equals 0, x equals negative 3. There's your two solutions. Quadratic equations can have two solutions. Sometimes they can have one, and there's actually some cases where they might not have any. Look at the next one. Notice that this example here worked because we had it equal to 0. If two things multiplied together equal some other number, say 3 or 4, or in this case 12, you can't make any determination about what they are. They have to equal 0 in order to determine that one of them is 0. So when solving a quadratic equation, it's a good idea to always start by setting it to 0. If I subtract 12 from both sides, I get 0 on the right side. And now I can try to factor this, and it does factor. x take away 4 times x plus 3. Since negative 4 and positive 3 add to negative 1 and multiply to negative 12. Now that I've got it set to 0, I can say that that means either x minus 4 equals 0 or x plus 3 equals 0. Either x equals 4 or x equals negative 3. Those are our two solutions. Another example, 4n squared plus 8n equals 0. So this is set to 0. That's good. We can try factoring it. Now notice this isn't a trinomial, but we can common factor there's a common factor of 4n, and we get n plus 2. How do we do this one now? Well, notice we're still multiplying two things together, 4n and n plus 2. So either 4n equals 0, or n plus 2 equals 0. If 4n equals 0, then n equals 0. If n plus 2 equals 0, then n equals negative 2. That should make sense. Imagine subbing n equals 0 here, and you get 4 times 0 plus 8 times 0, which is definitely 0.
also works if you sub negative 2 in. 4 times negative 2 squared would be 16 plus 8 times negative 2, 16 minus 16, which is also equal to 0. What if you can't solve a quadratic equation by factoring? For example, if you tried to solve this one by factoring, you would find that you can't do it. There's no two numbers that multiply to negative 1 and add to 9. The only numbers that multiply to negative 1 are negative 1 and positive 1, and those would add to 0. So you're stuck. So it can't be factored. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have solutions. And that is what we're going to introduce now, which is called the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula solves quadratic equations. And this might be brand new to you if you haven't necessarily seen this before. So if we have the equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, then the solutions to that equation will always be given by this formula right here. x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. It's a bit of an ugly looking formula if you've never seen it. It's one of the most important formulas in math, though. It's used a lot. So it's a little confusing. It's a formula that can be used to solve equations. So in our equation, we have x squared plus 9x minus 1 equals 0. So here, a equals 1, b equals 9, and c equals negative 1. And so we can plug those values into the quadratic formula. Negative b is negative 9 plus or minus the square root of 9 squared. Take away 4. a is 1. 4 times 1 times c is negative 1, all divided by 2 times 1. And we go from there. Now notice the fraction is everything is up on top of the fraction. Okay, so the division happens at the very end. The next thing I like to do, I mean, first of all, 2 times 1 is 2. That's pretty easy. I like to figure out what's underneath the square root sign. So this is going to be 81 take away 4 times negative 1, or 81 plus 4, which is 81 plus 4, which is 85. Okay. Next, we probably start to use our calculator. I actually like to break it up at this point. I like to think about the positive answer and the negative answer next. So one of these answers we get from adding the square root of 85 and the other answer we get from subtracting the square root of 85. I tend to do most of this on my calculator. And let me just show you what I get when I do that here. Okay. So I'm going to look at negative 9 plus the square root of 85. I usually just hit equals there. Oh, sorry. Negative 9 plus the square root of 85. On this calculator, I have to close the bracket underneath the square root of 85. Equals. And then I divide that by 2. And that will give me one of my answers. 0 0.10. Oh, that's very close to 0 0.11. So 0 0.11 is an approximate solution. It's not exact. And the other one I get from subtracting the square root. So negative 9 subtract the square root of 85, hit equals, and then I divide that by 2, which gives me my other answer of negative 9.11. So there we have those two solutions using what's called the quadratic formula. We'll try another example now. x equals 1 minus 6x squared. I notice that this is quadratic because of the x squared in it. Now, the quadratic formula assumes that your quadratic equation is written in this form, set to 0. This isn't set to 0. In fact, even if I was going to solve by factoring, I'd want to set it to 0. So I'm going to do that next. Bring everything to the left, and I get 6x squared plus x take away 1 equals 0. That's might factor but it's a little bit difficult to factor, so you can use the quadratic formula. Here your a value is 6, your b value is 1, and your c value is negative 1. So x equals negative b, just copying down the quadratic formula to start, 
plugging in the values. So negative b in this case is negative 1, plus or minus the square root of 1 squared, take away 4 times 6 times negative 1, all over 2 times 6. Okay, so just filling in a, b, and c. The next thing I like to do is I'm going to replace that with 2 times 6 is 12, and I'm going to figure out what this stuff here is. So this is 1 squared is 1. Take away, now you're taking away a negative, which means you're going to end up adding. 4 times 6 is 24, negative 24. So it's 1 subtract negative 24, or 1 plus 24, which gives you 25. Now the square root of 25 is actually just 5. So in this particular case, we can just replace that with 5. And then we can look at what our two solutions will be. One of them when you add. If you take negative 1 and you add 5, you get 4 over 12, which reduces to 1 third. So there's one of our answers, an exact answer of 1 third. If you multiply, or sorry, if you subtract negative 1, take away 5, you get negative 6 over 12, which is negative 1 half. There are our two solutions. Now I'd like to point out that you could actually factor this one. It does work. If you know how to do it, it actually factors to 3x minus 1 times 2x plus 1 equals 0. You do not have to solve it this way, but you certainly could. If you did that, you'd say either 3x minus 1 equals 0 or 2x plus 1 equals 0. That gives you 3x equals 1, x equals a third, one of the answers. Or 2x equals negative 1, x equals negative one half. So there's another way to do it by factoring if you know how to factor something like this. You could just guess and check. 3x times 2x, 6x squared. 3x times 1 is 3x. Take away 2x gives you the 1x. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. So that is an option. I'm not doing those kind of factoring with you this time. We just don't have the time left in the semester. and just trying to give you some of the basics. Here is a picture of the graph y equals 3x squared minus 4x take away 1. And suppose our goal is to find the x and y intercepts. So the x intercepts are the points where the graph crosses the x axis here and here. There are two of them. And the y intercept is the point where the graph crosses the y axis. Now it sure looks like the y intercept is negative 1. And I can't quite tell what the x intercepts are. We can still solve this algebraically. Let's start with the y intercept. At the y-intercept, our x value is 0. And that's because on the y-axis, your x value has to be 0 because you haven't moved to the right or the left. So one way of finding the y-intercept is just set x equal to 0. If I do that in this equation, I get y equals 3 times 0 squared, subtract 4 times 0, minus 1. Well, that's just 0, and that's just 0, so I end up with y equals negative 1 which ends up being that last number there. So there's our y-intercept, 0, negative 1. Let's talk about x-intercepts. So to find an x-intercept, notice that at the x-intercept, when a graph crosses the x-axis, no matter what type of graph it is, it must be the case that the y-value is 0, because the y-value tells you how far up or down to go on the graph. And in order to be on the y-axis, it must be that your y, sorry, in order to be on the x-axis, it must be that your y-value is equal to 0. So to find the x-intercepts, we could set y equal to 0. We get 0 equals 3x squared, take away 4x, take away 1. It's not a nice, simple trinomial, so I'm actually going to go ahead and use, again, the quadratic formula, x equals negative b, plus or minus, square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, where my a value is 3, my b value is negative 4, my c value is negative 1. So I sub those in. I'm going to get negative negative 4 plus or minus negative 4 squared take away 4 times 3 times negative 1 all over 2 times 3. As I go to work this one out, negative negative 4 is positive 4. And if you get negative 4 squared, subtract 4 times 3 times negative 1, you should get 28. Okay, that's because you have 16 plus 12, which is 28, all divided by 6. 
Using a calculator will give you the two answers, and I'll just write them down here for you now. One of them is approximately 1.55, and the other one is approximately negative 0 0.215. And looking at the graph, that certainly seems to make sense. That's about 1.55, and there's our other one at negative 2.15. One common use of quadratic equations is in what's called projectile motion problems. So anything that involves like flight, in this case, shooting a rocket into the air, no matter how you shoot that rocket into the air, no matter what speed, that graph of height versus time is going to form a parabola. So we can tell from looking at this equation, it's obviously a parabola because of the t squared, but remember that the negative 4.9, that that tells us that the parabola opens down, which also makes sense because when you shoot a rocket into the air, you would expect it to go up and come back down. The first thing that's asked for in this question is the initial height of the, ro the rocket. So the starting height, which is this height right here, which may or may not be zero. The initial height is the height when time is equal to zero. So if we sub in time equals zero, we can solve for the initial height. We can find h of zero. When we do that, everything becomes zero except for the 1.1. So the initial height of the rocket is 1.1 meters. Notice in the problem, our height is given in meters and our time t is given in seconds. So the starting height here is 1.1 meters. How long is the rocket in the air for? Well, at some point it lands here. Notice that the height is equal to zero when it lands. So really, that's what we're trying to figure out. When is h of t equal to zero? If we sub that into the equation, we will get zero equals negative 4.9 t squared plus 16 t plus 1.1. And we're left to solve this equation, and we can do that using the quadratic formula. So t will be equal to negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Our a value is negative 4.9. Our b value is 16. Our c value will be 1.1. So 16 in for b, so it's negative 16 plus or minus. 16 squared subtract 4 times negative 4.9 times 1.1 all over 2 times negative 4.9. Continuing with this equation, 2 times negative 4.9 is negative 9.8. And all this stuff under the square root sign, I recommend just using a calculator to figure it out. You should get 200 and 77.56 when you work that out. And then I'm left with two answers. One of those answers is when I add that value, and the other answer is when I subtract it. Again, with a calculator, you should get negative 0 0.067 or 3.33 for your two answers. Well, how is it that we have two answers? Well, let's go back to the graph here. It actually makes sense. This must be the 3.33. But notice that when we shoot the rocket into the air, it's only part of the parabola that actually describes the height of the rocket. For, there's no such thing as negative time, and there's no such thing as the rocket continuing to drive itself through the ground after it hits the ground. So the other x-intercept is what you would get if you actually drew the rest of the parabola in, and it'd be a small negative answer. Since we assume that t must be bigger than 0, we can cross this answer off and say that our answer is 3.33 seconds. So it's in the air for about 3.33 seconds. OK, this lesson just summarized some of the quadratic function material that we never got to, um, and hopefully will help you for next year or whenever else you need uh, this stuff. So um, if you're having any trouble, feel free to uh, shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to help you. OK, thanks, and bye for now.